Thank you, and I, I appreciate that. And uh, I congratulate uh, AHF2 on this uh, course agenda. There's a lot of meetings, especially coming out of COVID, and you look at this course agenda, the way it's structured and things like that. So, you know, I think this is awesome, and I, I hope it turns into a best practice. Um, I've been doing this for about 35 years. I'm an R&D guy um, at heart. Um, I, it's big company, then do small companies, and got acquired big companies and small companies. And, you know, you, you're, I'm back at Striker eight years after a Mako acquisition, so I was with Mako, uh, working with some of you back then. Um, so there are perspectives. This is more about what's going to go on today, what's going to go on into the future. And I will tell you a couple things. And for regardless of what company you're from, you should have heard some consistency. But whether you're a surgeon, whether you're a perioperative nurse, whether you're a hospital administrator, whether you're working in an insurance company, this industry is changing. And it's changing fast. And it's changing fast, and I think actually the next couple of years are going to be the most, some of the most exciting years in orthopedics that we've seen in decades. And part of the reason is because what data is going to unlock for us. So you've seen a lot of focus on the data. What does the data do for us? What's the value of the data? Why would companies want to spend money on it? How can a public company like Stryker actually benefit shareholders by this? So it, if, you're, if you're in industry, you see industry reports, if you're an analyst, Analysts are writing up all the time. We get investor queries all the time. Doesn't even matter if you're in the United States, if you're in Europe. I was just presenting um, over in Australia. Same topic, same thing, right? Data, data, data. We don't know enough about our patients. We are not providing as orthopedic companies enough insights on patients to help with clinical decision management. And we are living in a world right now where there is an expectation on companies to contribute to improving outcomes, but also the quality of care, and also safety, potential fall detections. Maybe technologies could figure a patient that may be not as stable. Maybe we could look at the quality of care a little bit differently. Or what about workflow, efficiencies, economics? All those kind of things can be unlocked. Why have we as an industry have not done this well to this point? The reason is there's no motivation for people to work together. Orthopedics on the digital, digital adoption curve, you know, is all the way on the bottom. If you think of like Amazon right now, you trust it. You're giving your credit card. You're giving all the information away. You're giving more information on your buying habits to Google. You know Google's going through your email every second to see what you're getting advertisements from and actually what keywords are always in there. You know credit cards, you transfer credit cards all over the place. But in our case, we could not stitch the continuum of care together unless hospitals wanted to work with companies, unless companies were willing to look at patient data. What about the physical therapist? What about pharmaceutical? We needed so many different areas of data from so many different disciplines to pull together to come a story. Nobody wanted to do it. It's only now do hospitals realize in some cases you gotta partner with industry because you can't do it yourself. And physicians by, by, by you, you may want data off some of our equipment and we need to help with that too. So now the conversation is going and the conversation is going in a good direction. And part of the reason I'm excited about my, my role is at Stryker right now, if you think about it, Stryker's one of the only companies in the whole world that can outfit an operating room. I don't know if you're aware, but we can own 70% of a back of an ambulance. If you think if we activated all the hospital beds we have deployed globally around the world and use those as data hubs, we are now talking about a lot of things. But in a company like Stryker, it's very decentralized. If you happen to be an orthopedic surgeon that does hips, knees, sports, shoulders, and spine, you're gonna see people represented from five different striker divisions. The decentralized structure has really worked well for us, knowing the customer, understanding what the market needs are, having individual sales forces. We like that, that helps us grow, that keeps us as a Fortune 250 company. But you know what, it doesn't work? It doesn't work on some of the upstream innovation. It doesn't work on some of the things like, for instance, why is there just not one connectivity protocol for all of Stryker? Product security, the way to handle data, the way to look at AI. All this equipment here, this is Stryker equipment. Do you know none of it's really connected to one another? Do you know none of it has the same protocol to actually be sent out of the hospital? Do you know the way the data is migrated onto a cloud? It's totally safe and secure, but it's all different. It's not queryable and simple. So now we have the opportunity at Stryker to leverage what we already have in the field. All that equipment that can handle unique differentiated data sets that you cannot get otherwise out of that operating room. So to help facilitate all this, on this box along the bottom, Digital Robotics Enabling Technologies, a brand new division that I'm 
Proud to Lead, that we created about a year ago. We have about 800 people in this right now. We'll be well over 1,000 in the not too distant future. And it is the focus to look at all the data capabilities of robotics, Does keep designing robotics, keep doing new applications, keep doing new software, like on Mako, there's hip and knee and partial, there's gonna be shoulder, there's gonna be spine. But then, write the software so you could look at what data sets come out of it. And then look at connecting the robot to the internet. And then look at what you do with the data and how you handle it. And all these different divisions, which all these boxes represent different striker divisions. They all have a president associated with them. But now we have a division where I could go into each one of these, pull out some of their best, leverage it across the other divisions, connect things all together, and look at striker as one striker. And this is part of what we're doing when we, we have a lot of this accomplished already. Part of the reason we've been quiet on this for the last two years is from a foundational infrastructure. There's no reason to talk about it unless you're ready to do it. Cybersecurity protocols, product security protocols, the way you migrate data, de-identify data, that's a big deal. So we have all that done, but you can see this is really when you think of an ecosystem, it's not just an ecosystem because it's on a cloud, it's what you can do with it all the way down to predictive analytics. And we need to start thinking about things differently. So don't think of a robot anymore as the center of the slide and everything else associated with it. It's part of a procedure. We have to get used to this continuum of care. We are now participating with software and applications on pre-planning. We have intraoperative, and now you've seen we have, we have post-operatively patient apps for patient inputs to all do different things. But this is where all these little data elements do it. And then when we think about a hip, and when we think about an anterior approach hip, and we think about these type of stems, well, guess what? That robot, it's helping execute a case, but it's a data machine. You know that robot has the capability to track a session file. Not only think about it, right? You do a plan, pre-plan, CT in the cloud. CT gets segmented into a three-dimensional bone model in the cloud, attached now to that patient record. This is all through normal course of care, totally entitled to this data. Then you have virtual models of striker implants that are superimposed on the cloud. Now you take that plan, you load that plan on the robot, guess what? Now you could do a session file, so you know where you started, you know the time of the procedure, you know how long each sequence took, you knew the changes across. So if a patient went in flexion, extension, look at soft tissue laxity, understanding for that profile, that patient, what the change was, it's captured on the session file, and then you port out the final three-dimensional placement of the implant. Now with wearables and everything else after us, you can now track all of that, but without that session file from the robot, you really don't have finite data enough to complete that whole continuum of care. So this is the type of data that we're collecting now. Some of it's from electronic health records, some of it's from physician inputs, some of it's from patient inputs, but you can see this is not just, okay, what implant went in and on a 2D x-ray, what is the anatomic alignment or what is varus valgus. There's a lot more associated with it. So you look at all these different parameters and you can do lots of different things with those parameters. So this is what you should really think about because this is the value proposition of data, whether it's hips or knees. I think in this case, I pulled a knee example, but now, Let's look at implant choice for that specific patient. Implant alignment, let's look at inventory management. We talked about what's the value proposition for this data? Well, there is low hanging fruit. There are things that we can get a benefit. So you do all this, right? But what are the insights you can get? Well, let's take an example. We should be able, in the not too distant future, where you come up with a model or a, you have access to a dashboard, you log into Striker dashboard. You have a 64 year old patient, 64 year old patient, What's the best implant for that patient? What, if I put 10 surgeons in a room, may plan different for that patient. Well, everyone can't be right, right? Or what's the optimized? Okay, so now I tell you it's a 64-year-old patient with a BMI of 39. I'm just making this up, by the way, as I stand here. A BMI of 39. And this patient has two millimeters of bone erosion on their medial tibial side. And this person has posterior lateral osteophytes and this person's a diabetic. We could factor all this into different inputs and now st with statistical significance, you will get, is that patient a CR, a PS knee, or a partial knee? Is that patient with a readiness score for surgery? Looking at B score and bone mass density index, so is that patient cemented or cementless? Is that patient safe based on statistics for outpatient surgery or should they stay in the hospital for three days? 
Does that patient benefit from six weeks of physical therapy or was four weeks enough? Is that person a fall hazard person? Is that person a wound healing challenge? What should we set expectations for patient satisfaction? And on top of that, we're gonna be able to determine if that benef patient benefits from a certain alignment of a prosthesis. All those kind of things, that is in the not too distant future. With statistical significance, you'll be able to query a database now, and that creates a plan, and that plan will go onto the robot. This was just published this week, so um, I just wanted to share this with you just to show you um, the value. This is uh, for Professor Lustig out of, out of Lyon, um, if you know him. And in this case, this was, we took a lot of data, we took 1,000 patients, and we looked at osteophytes. And we looked at where the osteophytes were, and we looked at the volume of the osteophytes. And then we tried to look at BMI, and we tried to look at age of a patient, and volume experience of a surgeon, just to see could we get predictor of OR time in hospital, and OR time what could be with experienced surgeons in the ASC. Now this is you know, not super like, oh my gosh, compelling, I'm gonna change healthcare, but it just show you where we want to see what the data. So here, we just took that data, and honestly, we did osteophyte recognition, we correlated osteophytes with data. We'd never have done this before in orthopedics. And then on top of that, we look across and we look at different boundaries. And the great thing about data, when, especially when you have a three-dimensional model, I could take thousands of anatomic landmarks and actually compare them against something else. And then you just run it through these decision trees. You hear about machine learning, right? So you feed the database, you feed the database, and then you keep testing, testing, you train the database, you train the database, and then you get a final model. And over more time, it gets smarter and smarter because it keeps training itself on what the end result conclusion was. So kind of exciting. But then the next phase is to get this level of data. Now let's add the data. So now we have the capability to pull electronic health records. We have the capability, by the way, also now for Stryker equipment to push Stryker data back into electronic health records. And as we look at this, we can look at everything from physical therapy, we could look at cost of the procedures. Um, some of this requires large institutions to want to partner with us, some of it. But you get to the point right now where you could get hip and knee profile of patients and you can get such specific levels of data that it really, really is remarkable. And here, I'll just show you this osteophyte detection. We're gonna be releasing this relatively soon. And this will actually be able to quantify now, and we'll get to hips after this, but it'll be able to quantify a knee patient like we never had before. So we'll be able to quantify a knee patient by not just age and all that stuff, bone mass density, extent of osteoarthritis, B score, osteophyte location, and this is all data, all data off of CT digital information that we already have. And this is just a matter of training algorithms. And eventually this will help. So what is the first thing that this is going to help where you say, okay, give me an appreciable benefit to this? It's this. So this is an actual case. These are actually renderings of some of the new software we're putting out, by the way. So see all the way on the left, that's auto segmentation. So as I said, the CT goes in the cloud, in the cloud, auto segmentation. You can see the level of detail of osteophyte recognition and things like that on auto segmentation. You will be able to be sitting at home on a laptop and you will be able to query this and look at individual patients, look at the models, look at things, and do things like you never had before, not to mention computer simulation of motion, flexion, and everything else. Then you can see how good the segmentation model, look how good we've been getting with rendering. So this visualization and things, it's all improving. It's just getting better and better. And these are virtual models, so it automatically will place the right size of the implant and location where restoration of a joint line and simulation and flexion, and that's the plan that will get loaded on the robot. So smarter use of data on the front end, clinical insights, helping with the decision, automating the process, making it more efficiency, giving statistical confidence to healthcare. So doing things in a way, and then the robot essentially becomes the enabler. It's the execution of that plan. Then what do you do with it further? Go one step further, you talked about mixed reality. I am a huge supporter of mixed reality, by the way. I think for what OSA's done on, on, on training and things like that, I think that's remarkable. And the easier you get access to more information, and the more you could do it, and the more you could learn, and the more you could get insights, you know what, that benefits everyone. Absolutely 100% benefits everyone. 
Now also mixed reality by itself, just having it as a funny monitor inside like you're playing video games, that's not a value proposition. But bringing data and bringing a plan so you don't have to look at a monitor, but making it more convenient, making it real time, this is what we're doing right now with Blueprint. So this is HoloLens where we program the HoloLens and Blueprint which is on shoulders, it, in Blueprint on the bottom, it'll help determine whether it should be a reverse shoulder or a total shoulder. It'll look at where the glenoid positioning is, where the humeral head resection is, and the thickness of the humeral head, and the restoration of the center of motion. That then gets transferred into the HoloLens glasses, and you can see we're superimposing where the resection is. Um, we're with navigated tools, you see real time where the tool is, just suspended right above uh, the incision, and by the way, this will allow, I think, to smaller incisions and things like that. Expect to see this in the future embedded in striker helmets. Expect to see this being transferred overall into spine, trauma, extremity, sports medicine. Expect this to be associated with the MAKO procedure that works on user interface, workflow, efficiency of the procedure. Expect this also to be able to be a data capture with once cameras activated on front of these things. These are all additive technologies that'll work for efficiency, work for consistency, reduce the burden on training, and also reduce the learning curve. Now let me show you one other example of data that maybe you don't think about necessarily. But when we think of Stryker, remember as I said, we, we outfit a whole operating room, blood removal systems, Neptune, things like that. Well these are used in orthopedic procedures. So now we're focusing on not just the data on executing where the implant goes, but what is all the other data associated with that procedure? And blood loss, blood volume, all those kind of things matter. We actually participate a lot in, in other procedures, colorectal procedures, sometimes where you have hemorrhage issues, um, uh, cesareans, where you get you know, deaths of moms going through the procedure. So we have a sponge count, surge account. Some of you may be familiar with it, right? Sponge is not left behind. Right, so, so that's good. Now what can we add to that with data and machine learning to make that better? One thing it's telling us, it's telling us the quantity of the sponges. It's not giving us an indication of the bleeding of that patient. Now if you look at these two, if you look at these two canisters, right, you may not see there's a remarkable difference. Just because the size of the canister and the density of the fluid, you're not having light transfer through it. But not having light transfer through it doesn't mean you don't have a problem. If you actually look at the amount of blood inside, there is a problem on the one on the right. You may have not recognized it with human eyes that there's a tenfold difference, right? So now we have technology that's developed that we're going to include in these procedures where this is the first phase, you lift it up, and with an iPhone and using a camera but machine learning algorithms off different visualizations of different optics, it can actually determine exactly what the quantification of blood and if there's a blood problem and it'll actually map out the color. And this is just by color concentration and differentiation of colors from areas to the side of itself. This is the first phase. The next phase, we're putting this in line and in tune. So we'll be able to tell if someone's hemorrhaging or there's some other issues. And this will go back into electronic health records. And this will also go back into the patient profile. So we're looking at everything that there's possible around the operating room. So I will tell you, when you think of digital, Think of things differently, think of orthopedics differently. It's about everything associated in the continuum of case. It's everything that benefits that patient. It's everything that looks at the safety of the patient, the quality of the procedure, and it all is from pre-op all the way from post-op. We as an industry are starting to think like that in a really big kind of way. And if you really want to think of the future, this is a striker operating room. Expect all the equipment connected. I didn't put in there that the surgeon wearing mixed reality glasses but between mixed reality, real-time data, connectivity of all the equipment, access into patient records, and be able to query real-time from the operating room against a cloud database of what the next step possibly in some of the procedures, if something went wrong, there will be two-way communication back to it. So I can tell you, we're in a really good place right now. I think the industry as a whole wants us to be healthy. We're watching AI closely. We're watching bias in data. We're protecting the data, we understand the value of doing that, and we're trying to get insights that actually offer advantages in many different ways. So we're in a really good place, but this journey is gonna go fast. The slow company loses in this. It doesn't matter whether you're a Depew, J&J, a Stryker, or a Zimmer. The small companies, the fast companies move quick, 
Big companies have to learn to move fast, have to do it with agility, but this opportunity is just too great for us to miss. It will be exciting times in the future, and we are on a good journey. Thank you.